Good morning, glue troopers. Mm. The elixir of life. Been uh, reading uh, Riding Rockets, that uh, a book by Mike Mullane. That uh, Mike Mullane was one of the shuttle astronauts. Uh, this was sent to me by Rick, and uh, it's an interesting read. And it's kind of ironic that I'd be in the middle of reading this when uh, General Yeager passed. Uh, kind of bookends on the the rockets going from the very beginning of the program to the very end and uh, well the space shuttle being kind of the end of NASA's building rockets uh, we of course now have uh, the civilian rockets and I gotta be wondering I know some of us build uh, scale model rockets and uh, I was thinking what would no no of course with me it's a no-brainer my favorite is Saturn V as far as just as rockets go but uh, actually, aesthetically, my favorite rocket is the Mercury Redstone. The symmetry, the, uh, the red escape tower, and the black capsule, the black and white body. And that got me wondering, uh, if you're a rocket or missile builder, uh, you know, which one is your favorite one to model? And uh, it also got me wondering about, uh, I, I, I'm sure there are kits out there of, uh, uh, Elon Musk's, and uh, if nothing else, I'm sure the resin makers are making some of, haven't really looked into it, but uh, of course the Elon Musk rocket and Bezos and the rest of them, because they're kind of uh, a new territory where uh, models are at. And, uh, you know, yesterday science fiction, today science fact. And in case you're wondering about this noise in the background, the cat was playing in the window and now she's running around here, so if the camera starts shaking, that's her. And, uh, and no, she will not hop up on my lap. Only my wife can pick her up. I can pick her up for about five seconds and then she gets like, no, you're not mommy, and off she goes. And there she goes. So anyway, um, uh, I have found that rockets can be, although usually it's pretty simple to put them together, uh, with the exception of a lot of the Russian rockets because they have that that girder work between stages, that can actually be tricky to make, uh, especially to make it look good. And uh, especially if you're doing something like the N1 rocket that has several stages all separated by this rather complex uh, um, girder work, which is like a framing. And, uh, uh, but I found that rockets can be a little tricky to build because although often they're fairly simple, like on the parts count, you get it together, but then you have these long seams you have to get rid of and everything, and it, it's quite the trick and or at least it can be it's a lot of filing and sanding and uh, then of course you don't want to lose what details on the surface so uh, and they're also very difficult to display because they're tall and they're skinny if you want to put them on a shelf you have to commit a lot of elevation to them so uh, I I've noticed a lot of people put them in the long tall linear uh, glass cases which is the perfect thing to put them in but if you uh, if you build model rockets for display unless you're just gonna put them on a table which is I imagine what a lot of folks do uh, they they actually although they're beautiful to look at uh, they can be a little deceptively tricky to build and they and they can also be deceptively they're, they don't they don't have a big footprint but they eat a lot of elevation so they can be deceptive the amount of space they eat up when you uh, when you display them And uh, uh, one of the nice things, though, about rockets is, uh, as if you remember the old monogram missile display, is that you can put a lot of them on a small footprint, uh, depending on, of course, how much space you want to have between them. And, of course, as much as anything, they, they tend to grab the imagination because, I mean, hey, who, who was a kid didn't want to be an astronaut? I mean... Mike Mullane was building model rockets back before model rockets were manufactured. You know, he was making them out of steel too, and almost harpooned his father one time. Rather funny story about that. And uh, fortunately, his parents were supportive. Of course, back then, nobody knew that a kid making homemade rocket fuel was a potentially explosive combination. I remember when I got into model rockets, there was uh, literature that was put out. Um, now, a lot of this literature was 
actually left over from like the 50s and 60s and I was building model rockets mostly in the 70s but and I, I found it pretty interesting but um, it was about you know don't try it, it, it was the thing about don't try to make your own rocket motors only use manufactured rocket motors and they talked to, they listed some actual accidents uh, what they called basement bombers which were kids that tried to make their own rocket engines and often using match heads and stuff and somehow they generate a spark and a bloody thing would blow up <clears throat> um, often with disastrous results and I mean there were some fatalities uh, uh, it was a, it was a real shame but uh, so I was absolutely paranoid about making my own rocket engines and now there's YouTube videos on how to make sugar motors and everything else which although much safer anything that's combustible has potential I remember shoving some D engines into an F-104 and a 148 scale F-104 and a big uh, F-111 and had to put that one on rails to get it to fly. And it flew about three feet. Of course, the weight and balance was always off. The F-104 went up straight for about 20, 30 feet. I mean, I was like, oh, hey, it's flying. And then it started corkscrewed. And uh, if there was ever a, a model that you could make an Estes model of, it would be an F-104. I mean, a model airplane because it's just... It, it was called the Missile of the Man, and it, it, it's so tailored for it. In fact, uh, oh, what was that company? I'm, oh, gosh, not, not Comet. They, they, they made the cheaper, they were a competitor for Estes for a while, and uh, they made the, the, the cheaper, less detailed models. And the name escapes me. One of you will remind me, or I'll look it up. Um, but uh, whereas an Estes rocket was seven, eight, nine dollars these things were like $3. And... Uh, I don't think the company was around that long, but they made, I think it was a MiG-17, and of course it didn't really look like a MiG-17, it was a tube with wings and a tail on it, but they called it, I think it was the MiG-17 or MiG-19, and that was the first rocket I'd ever seen that was actually an airplane, I mean genuinely uh, an airplane, and uh, when uh, my brother built it, my brother actually bought it and built it, and when he launched it, it didn't go straight like a rocket because it had a, an elevator on it. It just did a big loop under power. And I mean a big one, but it did it. If, I, if memory serves me right, it did a complete 360. Went back and the motor burned down, and then it would glide back down. And Oh, we were ecstatic. And uh, so um, I guess reading this book's got me you know, in the rocketry mode. One of the things I like about this book, and I would mentioned it yesterday, and by the way, Rick, thanks for sending that to me. I'm enjoying, it took me a while to get around to have time to start reading it, but, oh, by the way, uh, the power went out today, so that's why, well, I wouldn't say I'm late, I'm always late getting this thing out, but uh, that, that gave me a chance to read a little more in the book. And I went out where I normally shoot the videos, but it was so cold this morning, that room being surrounded by glass is a little too cold, so I thought I'd come in here and warm myself by the electric glow of the tree. But uh, I was uh, reading this, and you learn that uh, although who does, and everybody loves an astronaut, who doesn't want to go into space, you realize that uh, you know the astronaut office is the office is still just an office with all the problems you have in any other workplace environment, and uh, these guys are a bunch of a lot of them were Vietnam vets who were. Uh, getting into NASA at the, during the rise of uh, what today we call political correctness. And uh, it makes for some, some pretty interesting stories. <laughs> but, uh, well, that's really about all I got for this morning. I just wanted to uh, check in and uh, uh, probably mostly work on videos and go out and take some more pictures. That, the the um, I finally figured out where the timer was on the camera, and man, they buried that thing down deep. It doesn't indicate it. you have to go to the function button and hit that, and then scroll down from there. It's not on any of the main menus, but I finally found it, and the photographs are coming a lot better. It was camera shake that was causing a lot of those depth of field photos um, to to have uh, to be blurry. So now I have two second timers, and I literally step back from the camera and. Uh, uh, on one or two on one or two occasions, though, the uh, something would fall over <laughs> while I was taking it. You'll have like this ghost-like image. It's like kind of cool, but not appropriate. But what I was able to do was just give a little spin to the rotor blade on the helicopter and hit the button, and sure enough, it, there's your spinning rotor effect. 
but the helicopter has to remain motionless other than the rotor blade so uh, I can't really get the tail rotor going and I couldn't get I can't really do it while it's while it's uh, in the air you know like hanging from the string because I hang it from the rotor but uh, still just it, it's good enough and, uh, so forward progress is being made and uh, well there we go guys have a good morning model on